Church of Orange. How y'all doing? You guys blessed of God? Are you thankful for him? Hey, thankful for him and his faithfulness? Come on, let's include him in our praise and worship today. His presence can transform our lives. Yeah, let's be open to that. Let's be open to allow the Lord to transform our lives. All it takes is one word from him. Thank you, God. He is the mighty Jesus. He is the mighty God that's on our side. Let's just give him thanks today still, continuing to give thanks. It says giving thanks always in the Bible, right? Always giving thanks to the Lord God for what he does, who he is, what he's done for us. Thank you, God. We just thank you, Lord. Yeah. Come on, we're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving. Church courts with grace. Give thanks to God and praise Him. For the Lord, He is good. Yes, He is good. Come on. Shout for joy. All of the earth. Come worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Come before Him. A joyful song. For the Lord, He is good. Yes, He is good.
Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. We're praising Jesus, amen. This is God Almighty He's, who sits on the throne. So it's okay what you look like. Pour your praise out to him because this is what living looks like. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. Come on. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what living sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what Break down. 
and watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. All creation cries, we praise you. All creation worships you, Lord. Father God, you're the God that's on our side. Oh, we just praise you for that. I was reading in Philippians 2. I need to pull it up. But it says, it says to work out our, our faith, our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So it doesn't matter where you're at. Maybe you feel inadequate. And that's, that's the lie of the enemy. You know, because there's no condemnation, right? We know that there's no condemnation and maybe you feel like you're not you're not where you need to be maybe with the circumstances and the things that's that's going on in your life it's all telling you it what it is it's a bombardment from the enemy trying to keep you where you're at but it says that god works within us both to will and to do for his good pleasure so it's okay if you're not there yet church it's okay if, if the things around your life, the things, your circumstances don't add up and don't look like the things, the promises of God in this moment, because what he's doing is he's working in us, he's moving within us, and he's working it all out for his good pleasure. Amen, church? So this next song, you are here moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. Let's just pour out our hearts because he deserves all the honor. He deserves all the glory, all the praise, all the worship because he's always with us. He's always working things out. So we got to give him the glory for that. And we need to trust him, put our trust in him. So I encourage you, church, to put your trust in him while you worship to this next, next song.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh, come on, sing it out in faith. dark. 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Church, the Word of God tells us where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the Word of God tells us that the Spirit of God, the same, the same Spirit, Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if He dwells in you, right? The Word of God says He dwells in you, that He will quicken your mortal body, that He will bring life to you in your situation, in your circumstance. He is the one that brings life that he restores, he strengthens, he brings hope. Everything that we need, every situation and circumstance by the Spirit of God, that he, if we belong to Christ, if we are his, the Word of God says, then the Spirit of God is inside of us. What we're singing about, liberty, freedom, that we as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, we have liberty, we have freedom because the Holy Spirit, he lives in you. He dwells inside of you. If you are his, if you say, I believe in Jesus, I follow Jesus Christ, then the promise of God is that the Holy Spirit, he lives in you. He resides in you. That because you are his, you belong to him. And so he gives us life. He gives us strength to overcome no matter what we face. He gives us power to be able to live in our situation and circumstance, to be able to go through whatever we face. We are empowered by God's grace, by the Spirit of God with us. His provision is available for us every day. We are not weak. We are not hopeless. We are not those without hope, but we have the Holy Spirit with us always. The love of God is with us always. We have the communion of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Spirit of God with us always. So we have liberty, church. We have liberty wherever we are, more than just coming together. Yes, absolutely, in God's house. But how much more in everything we face, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Freedom reigns in our lives, church. The freedom of God reigns. We are not in bondage. We are not chained up. We are not in shackles. We are not given over to the things of the world or the lies of the enemy, but we walk in freedom. We live in freedom because the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. You belong to the living God. You belong to Jesus, the Spirit of God lives in you his presence freedom reigns wherever we are church amen would you bless the lord would you thank him for his goodness and for his promise here this morning bless you god we thank you we thank you in jesus name church would you please be seated praise god thank you worship team you know we have something special going on there this morning before we receive communion here. Uh, we, we get to be witnesses today of something very special that God is doing in the lives of uh, the church family here among us. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mike and Susan Barella. Would you please come on up to the stage here with me? Would you welcome Mike and Susan here today? Amen. Can I, can I get you both just to come up here and watch out for this cable? There you go. And we just stand here, please, and so everybody can see you. So what we're going to do today is, is Mike and Susan, uh, they want to recommit their marriage vows that they made to each other 25 years ago. And so, yeah, Amen. <laughs> And, and there's going to be a day where we're going to get to hear the testimony that God has done in their lives. Uh, and it's a, it's a great work that God has done. But it, it's in process. It's in process as well. But the, uh, their faith is, is that they uh, want to recommit their vows to each other and before the Lord. And they wanted us to be witnesses of that church. So would you agree here this morning and prayerfully support them as they're making this commitment before the Lord and we get to be witnesses of this. Can we all agree and say amen to that church? Amen. 
Amen. So today, Mike and Susan, they're going to recommit their vows before the Lord. Now, God planned and designed marriage with the Lord to be in the center. That's how God determined marriage to be. And, and that's what you both have committed to and agreed to in your hearts before the Lord and to each other. And so, Mike and Susan, as you both always remember to keep the Lord at the center of your relationship, you look to make each other your priority. You look to make each other the ones that, that God has brought into your lives that you both are a blessing to each other. You both are the blessing of the Lord to each other. As, as the Word of God says for men, that, that a wife is a blessing unto a man. And, and a wife is basically God saying to a man that you indeed are blessed, that God has provided to you. And that's what's happened, Mike, that, that Susan is your blessing. And Susan, you also understand that a husband, that's good that God has blessed you in this. And so these are, you're both a blessing to each other. And, and as this is how in God's divine wisdom, he purposed and planned all of this. So here's the scripture passage that Mike and Susan uh, have received as an encouragement for them in their recommitment here to the marriage. So I want to read this here, 1 Corinthians out of uh, chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. It says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It is his agape, his unconditional love at work in you by the Holy Spirit. And this is how we can be patient with each other. This is how you both will, will grow in your patience, working out your relationship, loving each other, but growing in patience and not being jealous or not giving over to the, a feeling of jealousy or not being boastful uh, uh, about yourselves, but sharing and giving to each other. Verse 5 says that love does not behave rudely and love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked Love thinks no evil. God's love in you because of the Holy Spirit at work in you as how, you, how we keep from operating in selfishness or demanding your own way. It's not for you to demand, well, I want things to be this way, or you to demand, I want things to be this way. But instead, it's the love of God working both in you that you can say not to be rude to each other, not seeking its own, not provoked, and thinking no evil of each other, not irritable or holding on to the past or keeping no record of wrong. It's love. It's the love of God that does it. That's how we do that. It's not in our own strength, not in our own power, but it's by the Spirit of God who works inside of us so that we can do that. So it says uh, that love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Again, God's love at work in you that you will not seek to be unfair or unjust, but considerate and always desiring to walk in the truth with each other. It's, it's that vulnerability before the living God and letting his light ex, uh, expose the darkness in, in yourselves personally, but bringing that together and saying, look, I desire to walk in truth with you every day and, and help me Right. As communicating as as helpmates with each other, as, as partners in this marriage to say, have mercy on me and, and I will have mercy on you. Have grace, show grace towards me as God has shown us both grace. It says, verse seven, bear, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Again, the agape of God, the love of God at work in you by his spirit is how you both will have strength to never give up to never give up on each other because it's not on your own strength, but it's what God provides, his power at work in you, your faith to continually grow and your hope will remain in all seasons of life. It is by his agape, his unconditional love at work in you that you will believe the best in each other because love believes all things. Love believes the best. Amen. Since God is the one who created and established marriage to be between a man and a woman, it must be built or established and lived out by his word. And this is what we endeavor to do, right? All Christians, but especially for 
in marriage, a husband and wife, they must always set out to live the word of God in marriage. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This was God's plan from the beginning, even before they knew what a father and mother would be. Right? God had established that a husband would leave his father and mother and be uh, uh, one with his spouse, that they would be one, not two, not separate. Right? And you, in, in your your past, you saw that happening, the, the, what the world tries to bring, that separation, but uh, God in his goodness brought about restoration and restored you both to Christ first, and then God at work in you has brought this restoration of each other in your marriage. It's a wonderful thing, church. Praise God. That's beautiful. Yeah. So, Mike, after I finish what I'm about to ask you, I would like you to please respond to Susan by saying, I do. So we're going to do something a little bit different. I know uh, we've got this adjusted for to everybody to see, but why don't we do this? Because I want you to look at each other. And maybe, Brother Mike, if you can just stand back just a little bit, and that way you can look at Susan in your eye and everybody in the church family can still see you. Mike, as a new creation in Christ, do you recommit your vow to Susan to be your wife making her your priority? Will you pursue her always, no matter the season, and forsake all others? Will you partner with her on this journey of life, walking in peace together? Will you live pure with her before the Lord and set your heart to be open to her in sickness and in health through all seasons of life? Will you love her as you love yourself? Will you cherish her and make her heart secure and serve the Lord your God with her in this marriage for as long as you both shall live? I do. Mike says, I do. Amen. Mike, please repeat these words to Susan, making a profession of your faith to her. So say, I, Mike. I, Mike. According to the word of God. According to the word of God. Recommit myself to you to be your husband. Recommit myself to you to be your husband. To love you as the Lord loves me and to care for you. To love you as the Lord loves me and to care for you. To lay down my life for you. To lay down my life for you. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. I publicly recommit that we are not two but one. I publicly commit that we are not two two but one. Amen. Amen. Susan, after I finish what I'm about to ask you, please respond to Mike also by saying, I do. Susan, as a new creation in Christ, do you recommit your vow to Mike to be your husband, to make him your priority? Will you pursue him and forsake all others? Will you partner with him on this journey of life, walking in peace together? Will you Uh, Will you live pure with him before the Lord and set your heart to be open to him in sickness and in health through all seasons of life? Will you love him as the Lord loves you? Will you honor him and serve the Lord your God with him in this marriage for as long as you both shall live? I do. Susan, please repeat these words to Mike, making a profession of your faith to him. I, Susan. I, Susan. According to the word of God. According to the word of God. Recommit myself to you. Recommit myself to you. To be your wife. To be your wife. To love you as the Lord loves me. To love you as the Lord loves me. To honor and care for you. To honor and care for you. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. I publicly recommit that we are not two but one. I publicly recommit that we are not two but one. Amen. Amen. And as a witness before the Lord, yeah, praise God. As a witness before the Lord with all these present today, we acknowledge and support your renewing and recommitment to each other as husband and wife. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Mike, you may kiss your bride.
Amen. Church, can we pray a blessing? Can we pray, pray a blessing upon Mike and Susan here? Father, thank you, Lord God, for Mike and Susan Barella. And Lord, thank you for the work that you, that you began, the good work that you began, Lord, that you're faithful to complete it. Lord, even as we heard during the worship, it is God who works in us, Lord God. It is you, Lord, who's working in Mike and Susan in their lives. And so, Father, we thank you. But Lord, as family, Lord God, as they are our brother and sister, we are their brothers and sisters, Lord God, and we thank you for them, and we agree to pray for them, to acknowledge the work that you are doing in them, and God, we, we thank you for the testimony, Lord God, that this brings faith, not only for them, but this brings faith to our hearts, Lord, to hear and see the work that you are doing in them, and we thank you for them, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Love you both. Love you both. There's our tissue right there. <laughs> amen. You know, as I said, there's a great testimony uh, and what God has done in their lives. And, and there's going to be a time where you'll get to hear that. Um, but for today, we just get to celebrate in this moment of uh, what is happening in them, and it's a, it's a blessed it's a blessed thing. So, Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God. Well, we're going to receive communion in this time. It was, you know, it's a, a, a wonderful thing what we're celebrating. But um, even in this worship, you know, let us remember we remember what Jesus has done uh, uh, for us. First John four nine through eleven. It says this, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, that he is the one that paid the price for us. And it says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That we're able, church, as even as we saw in, in Mike and Susan recommitting their, their vows to each other, our love is not because not out of our own strength. You might sometimes hear what the word of God says, and you may say, but Lord, I don't feel that love. I don't sense that love that, that your word states. But that's because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to love. Even in those moments where we don't feel, our emotions may not be there. Because it's not emotion. It's faith. It's faith believing the word of God. It's, it's faith believing that if the word of God says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That we can love one another by faith. That I can say, I love you by faith. Because for some, to say you love might bring up fear because that involves trust. And there might be a lot of broken trust that you've experienced in life. But we are followers of Christ. We're no longer ones who follow the ways of the world. And now we are able to love because of the work of God. Because God first loved us that we are able to love by faith. That we are able to operate by faith. Our motive is by faith because God, we believe by faith that God first loved us. Amen. Amen. That we, we believe that God loved us. It, that's entirely by faith and that's good and that's important to do that. But the word of God now says even more so that we, if God loved us, then we should love one another. We also ought to love one another. The Greek word for communion is koinonia. And in communion or koinonia, we are understanding it means fellowship. We fellowship with the Lord, and yet also in this time of communion, we fellowship one with another because we're sharing. We're sharing in this moment. We're sharing, remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for all who call upon the name of the Lord. And all who call upon the name of the Lord have been made brothers and sisters because of Christ. And so we do this as family. We do this in remembering God's love for us. So let me read to you 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. It says this. Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed and took bread, uh, and, and in which he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
and do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread before you? Would you break it, eat it, and thank the Lord and remember what he's done for us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your body. Thank you, Lord God, that we don't live by bread alone, but we do live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And you, Jesus, the word of God, you're also the bread of life. And so we thank you. And then it says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you drink the cup and remember what he's done? Jesus, we remember what you have done for us, how you shed your blood, how you suffered on the cross for us. You did it for us, Lord God. You had us in mind, Lord. It was the joy that was set before you because you knew that it meant our deliverance. It meant our freedom. It meant that we would become part of your family for all who would receive the gift of God. And so, Lord, we thank you. And as the word of God said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, as often as we do it, that we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We proclaim not only his death, his resurrection, that he is one day returning for all of us. For all who believe, for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, living God, for your goodness and your mercy to us every day. Amen. Amen. Can you thank the Lord here this morning? Bless him. Magnify him. Lord, you're so good to us. Thank you. You know, just a couple of announcements before we receive our, our tithes and offerings. Uh, just a reminder, this Friday uh, at 930, we will be meeting to decorate uh, the church. Becky is uh, organizing all of that and leading that. But this Friday, 930, there is a sign-up sheet in the uh, foyer. Um, if you haven't already signed up and you'd like to come on out and help us and join us. And, and if you in, in, enjoy decorating, you know, that's a gift. That's a gift. You know why? Because that's not my gift. I don't have that gift. I'll be here. I'll be here to help. But I'm not, I'm not a, a decorator. I'm not that. That is not. I, I ask people, hey, how does that look? What do you think about that? Does this look okay? You know, I ask my wife when I'm getting dressed, how does this look? Does this look okay? You know, because that, that's not my strength. Although I enjoy those things. I, I like to see it. I think it's beautiful. And, and I rejoice in it. But, but that's not me. But, but God does give gifts to people to do this. You know, it's not all about, you know, the spiritual gifts are not all about, you know, some are given the gift to heal. Some are given the gift to prophesy. Some are given the gift to move out in these powerful things. Some are given the gift of administration. Some are given the gift to encourage people. Some are given the gift to decorate. Some are given the gift to bake. Some are given the gift to cook. Some are given the gift to clean. Praise God. We need them. <laughs> so if, you, if uh, you're available uh, and you'd like to come out and help us uh, uh, this Friday, December 3rd, 930, we'd love to have you with us. There is a sign-up sheet. If you could just sign up just so we know how many we can count on. We're getting some good uh, sign-ups there already. But uh, please, if you can, please join us. We'd love to have you with us. It's, it's, a, it's a good time. We get the Christmas music playing, and we're decorating, and, and it's a blessed thing for God's house. Amen? All right. Uh, also coming up, uh, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, December 7th, um, we will have prayer here in the auditorium uh, from 6 to 7 p.m., so we invite you to come on out and join with us in prayer. It's a powerful time. It's powerful when God's people come together to pray uh, in agreement, that place of agreement, because Jesus says when two or more uh, agree concerning anything, whatever they ask, he says, I will do. In Matthew 18, that he says, I will do it. Whatever you ask, when you're in that place of agreement, that place of, that place of faith. You know, we, we prayed for uh, Chris Pio uh, a couple of uh, uh, the last time at prayer. She sent me a note. She says, since we prayed for her, the pain that she was suffering through has gone away. And so praise God for that, uh, God's, you know, what he does. And, and we've had several instances, you know, on, on our prayer nights where we've been able to pray for people and just seen uh, miraculous things happen. You know, even uh, I think of, of Taya, sweet Taya, you know, it was on a prayer night that we prayed for her and, and God really moved powerfully in her life. And, you know, that, that's just the goodness of God, right? Because God wants to move uh, 
in the earth, but God does it through his people. He does it through his people. He wants to do it through his people, his spirit working through his people. And so we invite you, encourage you, come on out. It's good to pray. Uh, Jesus says men ought to pray, people ought to pray always and, and not give up hope. So there you go. All right, we're going to receive our, our tithes and offerings at this time. And uh, yeah, <laughs> praise God. God is faithful and, and he's, he is good. God is the answer to every need. God is the answer to every need. Jesus teaches us how, to, how we are to pray. And he says this in Matthew 6, verse 11. He says, give us this day our daily bread. He's teaching us. He says that when we pray, we're to ask God, Lord, give us our daily needs. Give us our daily bread. Provide for us. Take care of us. Right? It's not for me to say, well, I got to go take care of myself. I got to go make it happen. I got to go do all these things. No, it's Jesus says, this is how you pray, that you ask God to provide for you, that you ask God, to, that he's looking for us to ask him, to seek him to provide, because that means that we're not trusting in ourselves. That means that we're trusting in the Lord. That's what that heart is, and that's the heart that God is looking for, because the heart that trusts in, them, in themselves, there's no faith in that. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because he who believes in God must believe that he is, and not only that he is, but that he's also the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you believe that God is, faith helps us to understand not only do we believe that God exists, that, that all of his promises are true, that they're yes and amen, but also it helps us to grow and understand that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God desires, his heart is set. That's what the word of God says in Hebrews, is that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And it's not just, not just talking about finances. God rewards in a plethora of ways, in a multitude of ways. Just his grace, seeing those that you're believing for in your, in your family, maybe for salvation or, or friendships, relationships. It might be, maybe if you're single, it might be for a spouse. You're believing God for a spouse. It might be for health. Maybe you're believing God to be, to, to be your healer. It might be, uh, God, you're believing God to be a restorer of relationships, seeing what God is doing in Mike and Susan's life. All of these things, but it is God. It is the Father. He's the one that's the rewarder. And that's why as, as believers, it's, we never look at others and go, oh, God, why are you doing it in their life where you're not doing it in my life? Because that's not faith. That's not abiding by what the Word of God says. That that's where you say, Lord, thank you that you're doing it in their life. And thank you, Lord God, that you also are doing that in my life because you're the rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Lord God, and based on what your word is, I believe who you are. I trust your word, and I, I thank you that that's your promise for me as well. That's your promise for them, but that's your promise for me as well. Amen? Amen. So an aspect that Jesus teaches us is he shows us we are to look to the Lord to be our provider and, and our answer to every need. Sometimes you just need to put it out there. Lord, thank you that we have this need, but thank you that you're the one that's providing it. And that, it, you may have asked it several times, but that doesn't mean that you give up. It means that you continue to say, Lord, thank you that you are my provider. Thank you that you're making a way. Thank you that you're providing for this situation. Thank you you're providing my healing. Thank you that you're providing restoration thank, of relationships. Thank you that you're providing uh, uh, an answer to this situation that's going on that we don't know how this is going to work out, but you know. See, all of these things, that's looking to the Lord to be our provider. Ephesians 3.20 out of the Amplified says, Now to him who, by, in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. That's God. That's God. That's, that's your Father in heaven. That's your Father who you're praying to. That's the Lord who hears your prayers, and that's the one that we're asking. Uh, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Provide for us, and let us remember that we're God's children, that we, are, we must not see that we're unworthy orphans, but that God the Father wills and desires to provide for his children. He wants us to trust that he will. He wants us to look to him as our source, 
Our good Father's measure for us is far over and above all that we could even dare ask or think, because that's how good he is. Amen? Amen? Here, let's pray. Father, thank you that you are our provider, that you provide our needs. And Lord God, even in this time of giving to you and to your house, Lord, I ask that you would, this seed that's sown in faith, that you would multiply it back. Lord God, as your word says, that the farmer he sows, he doesn't sow not thinking he's going to have a return, but he sows believing and trusting that there's going to be a return. And so, Lord, let it be the same way. This seed that's sown in faith, let it be returned back to the giver, multiplied, Lord God, in a plethora of ways, because you're good, you're our provider. And Lord, help us to grow in our trust of you and help us to see, Lord God, thank you that we will see it come back, Lord God, the blessing, the return, the, the, the seed that's sown in faith will grow into a crop super abundant beyond what we could even think or, or even dare ask as your word tells us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, if you're watching this online and you're, you uh, want to give a gift, uh, you can mail in your giving. Our address here at the church is 3514 East Chapman Avenue, Orange, California, 92869. Uh, here in God's house, we have the, the Church Center app that you can use on your mobile device. You can give to Life Church of Orange, California. Uh, as well as you can go online to our website, lifeoc.org. Uh, there's a place to give. Or here uh, in the house of God, you can uh, give a gift and deposit it there in the, the giving box at the back of the auditorium. So if anybody needs an envelope, uh, just raise your hand and uh, someone will come and, and bring you an envelope as well. God bless you all. You know, I want to say thank you to Caleb here this morning. Caleb was paying, playing on the bass. Thank you, Caleb. Caleb is a friend of Jordan Yarbrough's. Uh, Caleb attends Biola University along with Jordan. So God bless you, Caleb. Thank you so much for serving. Uh, we're, we're all the body of Christ, but thank you for serving in, in this house, a part of extended family. So, so we appreciate it very much. Would you welcome Pastor Glenn Whitaker all the way from Santa Ana, California? B-Y-O-P, bring your own podium. <laughs> it's only because i got to be different. Just want to be different. Y'all look really good today. Right. Look at those smiles. And I haven't even started talking yet. Praise God. Worship's been great, amen? It's phenomenal. We got to lift our voices and our hands. We got to see God's work. In restoration, awesome. Just totally, you, you have no idea. You know, we all see it in different eyes, different perspectives. Part of worship is, uh, is hearing God. Amen? Yeah. You know, when you worship, you need sometimes just to be silent yeah. and to listen. So that's my encouragement for you for the next half hour. You need to listen. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Don't make me come out there. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. We love him so much. All right. Thank God for glasses. How many say good luck? Glasses. Amen. Huh? 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 Mine are cheaters, though. Not that I'm a cheater, but these are cheaters. Hallelujah. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. God, we just, <clears throat> we respect and honor you today. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have anointed this place. I not only have pray for the anointing of the words and the message, but I pray that the ears to, will hear what you want each one to hear. I pray that their hearts are circumcised and soft enough not to reject, but to receive what you are giving them today. Everyone will hear something different. And I thank you, Lord, that, and I have no idea what, what that is. So this is all between you and them, Holy Spirit. And I think that they'll take that with them and it'll be an impact on their life and change them, even a smidgen, Lord, just to change their lives. So we're, we're not here just to play games because it's, it's Sunday. We're here to be in the presence of our God. We've got to worship you. We've got to give. We've got to honor you with testimony. And now we honor with the word, Father. And we thank you for this time that we share with you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. that's all right, in harmony. One, two. Praise God. We're going to talk about times of restoration. How appropriate. Yeah. How apropos. You know, the years of sin can take its toll. Amen? Yeah. 
It can take its toll on our lives and the lives of those around us, stealing and destroying all that is precious to us, robbing us of peace, of our joy, even robbing us of hope. Many are just hanging on to hope, leaving us empty and lifeless. It can destroy relationships, whether friends, family, or even both. And I was reading Joel 2.25, if many are familiar with it, where, where God says, I will restore with the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar. What has been stolen from you because of the consequences of your sin? That's what Joel was saying. He says, uh, according to Joel, God can restore what is broken or lost and change it into something amazing, literally amazing. And all you need is faith. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. In Luke 4.18, Jesus pr made a proclamation. And he stood there in front of everybody and says, the Holy Spirit is on me. You know, he, I believe he's on me. I believe he's on you. And Jesus said he's on me. And he has anointed me to do all the things that God has sent me to do. One of which he said, God had sent him to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. To heal the brokenhearted. Well, I look at that. Let's look at that word brokenhearted in Luke 4.18. It says the word brokenhearted in this verse is from the Greek word, which I will not even attempt to tell you because it's very long. And it's all Greek to me anyway. Uh -huh. It depicts a person who has been shattered or fractured by life. It is a picture of those whose lives have been continually split up and fragmented. It well describes the situations you may find in so many families today. If you are from a broken or divided home, then the word describes you and your shattered emotions you've, you deal with as an aftermath of the broken relationships. That's broken hearted. Yeah. But the great pastor Chuck Swindoll once said, our God is a master at turning devastation into restoration. Yeah. Can we get an amen on that? Yeah. He is the master at taking your devastated life and turning it into restoration. Yeah. Jesus went on to say, when he talked about the brokenhearted, he says that he came to heal it. He came to heal the brokenhearted. And that Greek word he used there, I, again, I will not attempt it and destroy it, but it means to set free or to loosen from the detrimental effects of a shattered life. doesn't mean I'm going to heal your hangnail. I'm going to deliver you, get rid of your cancer and heal. This is more of a release and a set free from the bondage of something that, that grabs a hold of you and won't let go. Sin, the consequences of sin and having it in your lives, especially if we're Christians and we enter into a realm that's not favorable to God, it'll grab a hold of you. Jesus says, I've come to set you free. Yeah. Amen? Amen? It goes on, also speaks of a release from the destructive effects of brokenness. The anointing of the Holy Spirit through Jesus offers the power to restore and release you from the captivity that has been held you in emotional bondage. Although families are filled with the brokenness of failed relationships, God's power and his love within his presence is enough to uh, restore those failed covenants. Amen. Amen. Jesus is sufficient to set you free and to, to heal you of the pain and the agony of the brokenness and the fragmentation. By his grace, he can restore what the enemy meant for destruction. You know that the enemy's goal is to destroy you. But he can't destroy you. But he can destroy things in your life so God will not be seen and he can own you and keep you in, in, in brokenness and keep you in agony. Jesus says, no, I've come to destroy the works of the enemy. So I've come to destroy those works in your life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is fixing the pieces of your life. As you sit here, this isn't something that it could be. This isn't something down the road that maybe you can get a revelation and happen. I'm telling you it's happening to you as you sit here today. Are you born again? Are you born again? 
have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then you are a great candidate for this. And it's happening as you sit there and you don't even know it. We want to bring you revelation today of who you are in Christ. You should not be walking in brokenness and devastation and pain and agony. Jesus came, to, he did something for you, so grab a hold of it. Make it part of your life. Hallelujah. God is fixing the broken pieces of your life. Get ready for restoration. God is preparing you for everything you prayed and that you hoped for. Because you're born again and it's, God has given it to you. There will be a special season of restoration that will take place. In fact, it's taking place as we speak. There is an escalation of all things, and this will manifest in a restoration of relationships that have been impossible to mend. You look at the world today. It's not a pretty sight, is it? It's not a pretty sight. There are people that hate you, and they don't even know you. There's people that hate. I, I've run into people, and I can see. I feel I, I used to you know, get my defenses up and drop my glasses. I get my defenses up and I want to protect myself from them. Then I realize these people are broken people. And they're so broken and so hurting, the level of pain they inflict on me is the level of pain that they're living under. And then, the God, then I remember God says, you know what, you've got an answer for their lives and it's not to hate them. And I, I tell you what, I am so guilty of doing that. But God, praise God, is working in me. I've gotten so much better. I don't hate, but I avoid. God didn't call us to avoid. He called us, and he fills us, and he anoints us, and he lives in us. Then he says, now go and tell somebody about me. If you have to live it, you have to speak it. And so I'm running into people, and there's people coming into my life that I once pushed away that I now have to embrace and pull in because God says, there's your assignment there's your assignment. You can't hide. Get out from under the bed. Come on. This is your assignment. Go get them. Quit hiding under the table. Because God has called us to be reconcilers. Restorers. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says this. Whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. We're all new creations. It means that the old way of living has disappeared. A new way of living has come into existence. Verse 18, God has done all this. He has restored our relationship with him through Christ. And guess what? He has given us this ministry of restoring relationships. In other words, God was using Christ to restore his relationship with humanity. And this is, this is probably my, one of my favorite parts that really gives me hope. We'll talk, I'll even bring it up a little later, but he says here, quote, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, he didn't hold people's faults or sins against them. I've got people that remember things I said and I did 30 years ago. I said that? I did that? Well, I was an old creature then. But they remember it. And they don't want to talk to me. They've held it in their heart for so long. Isn't that terrible? That's eaten away at their lives. They're in bondage. And you know what? God's going to send me, as he will you. You're going to say, oh, there's so-and-so. I don't want to talk. They said this about me 15 years ago. You know, they did this. Well, you know what? God's putting you in their life to bring them out of their bondage. You're ministers of reconciliation, whether you like it or not. We've got to bring God's love. Amen? He didn't hold people's faults against them, and he has given us this message of restored relationship to tell others. See, Christianity is, whether we like it or not, about relationships. We were doomed because we lacked a relationship with God. He knew it, but we didn't. And unfortunately, our faults and sins prevented us from, excuse me, prevented this from happening. It says in Isaiah 59 2, but your wrongs have separated you from your God. Your sins have separated you from God and your sins have made him hide his face so that he doesn't hear you. A lot of people like that. It's not much different from what goes on between you and other people though. Whether it be our sin, our faults, or theirs, it causes separation. 
It's hard to get, you know, it's hard to get past them. That's why we usually need a mediator. Need a counselor, a lawyer, you know, need a mediator. That's if we, that's if we choose to mend or pursue the relationship. The scripture said that God used Christ in, to restore his relationship with humanity. Jesus became the mediator, the guy in the middle. You know, these two people couldn't, you know, put in their gloves, they couldn't duke it out. They needed a mediator in to push them aside and, and cause them to work things out. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. The mediator, as the word reminds us in, sec, in 1 Timothy 2.5, where it says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, between God. He's not out here peripheral. When we need him, we bring him in. He's in the center. Yes. That's the man Christ Jesus. And it says the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. He's not talking about necessarily just the guy that's sitting on the throne, our Lord and Savior. It's the man that understands us, that knows the trials, and he knows how to talk to us, and he knows how to deal with things. He's our mediator. So that way, he's not only between God and man, but he's between us. You. you know, he's between the husband and the wife, the child and the parents. You know, the neighbors. Ooh, there's a bit. The, the Hadfields and McCoys. <laughs> it may take the same mediator to work out relationships between men to bring restoration. The fact is we didn't realize we had those faults that prevented us from having a relationship with God, and we came to see that in Psalms 19.12. For example, says none of us know our faults. Forgive me, the, the psalmist says to God, when I sin without knowing it. Don't let me know, don't let me do wrong on purpose, Lord. Or let me sin, let, or let sin have control over my life. Then I will be innocent and not guilty of some terrible faults. Let my words and my thoughts be pleasing to you, Lord, because you are my mighty rock and my protector. We do things we don't even do, know we're doing. I just walk outside, and before I hit the door, I've sinned 12 or 13 times. <laughs> And I don't even realize it. And no sins try to build up against you. But God says, no, no, no. Just bring them to me. Bring them to me. One of these days you won't do that anymore. Then there's ones we do know. And we, keep, we think, seek God constantly until he delivers us from that thing that drives us. It's all about the Lord delivering us and bringing restoration to our lives. Restoration can be a process. It doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And many of you know that. Yes. You know, but once you receive it, you embrace it, and you seek God to change me and make this situation right, he will do it. He doesn't do half a job either. Right. He's all the way or none. And he's just waiting for us to say, help me. <laughs> There's something important to know here, and that is that God did not hold people's sins against them. I mentioned I would say it again. We can see that in 2 Corinthians 5.19. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us the wonderful message of reconciliation. See, that is a conductive, a conducive attribute of our, of our sin. We have a tendency to hold things over people. Sometimes we have long-range memories. Some people don't have, they have short range, some have long range, and sometimes when it comes to holding stuff against people, people have long range. I'm reconnecting with a brother. He's a, younger than I am, but I haven't seen him for, I don't know, 25 years plus. And uh, my father passed away, and I found out my brother, he lives in Elko, Nevada, and that he's kind of a special needs like my other brother that I've uh, taken care of now. But he told, he doesn't even know me, but he told somebody that he's afraid of me. He doesn't know me because of the authority of Christ that's in me because he, he's a heavy drinker and he's in bondage to things. He's my new assignment. Not to make him in my image, heavens, heaven forbid that, but to bring him to reality of Christ in his life. And he has oughts against me that I don't even know of yet. So there's my new assignment, Restoration. And it's restoration of the family. So now I have two special needs brothers that I have to restore. I don't have to restore. God has to restore them. But I've got to be an image for them to emulate. Yeah. So now I'm going to win over my second brother. It's just, just now happening. So I'm looking at this long-range stuff. And even though I don't have control, I have Christ. Yeah. 
So you don't have to worry about what if, or they may say this, they may do that. No, what you got to do is say, it's up to you, Lord. I'm going to go. Here I am. And you may stand there face to face and have no idea what to say. But the Lord will fill your mouth. He'll fill you with love. I'm feeling more compassion towards my brother, who I really don't know. But I'm feeling compassion for where he is at. He's alone. He's lost in his sin and everything else. And the Lord says, I, I'm, he's throwing me out there like a, a worm. You know, I'm a bait. Really, man? You know? Yeah. But this worm has arms to pull him in. We all have our assignments. <clears throat> those sins and those iniquities and faults, the wrongs, whatever you call them, they once were a wall between us and God and prevented that most vital relationship that any one person could ever have, and that was between you and God. God created a way to, break, to, pick, uh, to blot them out and eliminate them from the equation. And he is no longer... Uh, uh, equation blah, blah, blah. no longer through Jesus holds them against us. These glasses don't work as well as they're supposed to. <laughs> Everything's a blur. <laughs> Thus opening the way for us to be able to walk right in onto God up to, his, up to his knee and jump in and say, we need to talk. The doors are open. And the blood of Jesus is our covering. Yes. And it's... Uh, <clears throat> The blood of Jesus are covering, and from God's heavenly perspective, that's what he sees when he looks at us. That's right, when, he comes, when it comes to his children, the father is not sin conscious as much as he is son conscious. He's more conscious of the Christ that's in us, not the sin that we battle. He is son conscious because the blood is over us. It covers a multitude of sin. Since we are under the blood and our bodies are earthbound, occasionally we get preoccupied with what's beneath and not above, but God is there to rescue us. So we just learned that faults and wrongs that were not compatible to a relationship with God kept us from being able to be close to Him. There are faults and sins that are such an entity between us and God that He cannot even look at us or listen to us. He cannot even have a conversation with us. It would make sense that it's the same problem that many are, are having between people and their family, between their friends. It's stuff that we have between each other. What we're trying to dig in here is to find out that we can be set free from that. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says that God has restored our relationship with Him through Christ and has given us this same ministry or same ability of restoring relationships. There's some of the things that he put the messages in us to relate to them. One is if you want restoration in a relationship, you need to want it greater than the person that you need to restore. God did that. God had no guarantee. His son hung on a cross. And it was all meant to bring us to him. No guarantee. But he wanted it more than we did. He wanted it. In fact, he was the only one that started with that wanted it. Now he desires that you want it. Secondly, you need to realize that if you are chosen, you've chosen to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're no, you're no longer be like you once were because you made that decision. Hang on, you're a new creation. A new creation simply means that you don't think like the old guy. People try to revert back. It doesn't work anymore. I, 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 I sometimes will go back to those early days and go, how come I like that? I didn't like that. And how I used to act, it was amazing. I'm a new creature. Yeah. I'm a new creation. Daily, yeah. daily, yeah. I'm still growing in this new creature. Yeah. I have the, 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 the human side of me, this, this natural side that wants to respond certain ways, but God won't let me because I've embraced his son. And I, I would be dishonored to Christ to act like the old man because he died for the old man. And I accepted it. I can't go back there again. Yeah. You can't. you got to forget the past. Forsake the past. You have memories of it, you forsake the past. You're going forward with the decisions you made. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Three, you need, you need to also realize that you cannot do things by yourself. 
You understand that? You need Jesus to get you out of whatever it is you're in. You need him to mediate for you. In order to get results, you need to submit to his way. People hate that word submit. You know, I've counseled people who are getting married, and I'll bring up that word. You talk about manifestation. <laughs> you talk about a manifestation, submit. You know, you know he's the boss now, I've got to give him everything, break out the whip and the chains. <laughs> submit simply means as you make that other person number one over yourself. That's all submit is. You submit yourself to each other, saying you're more important than me. And when you both do that, your, your backs are covered. You're covering each other. You're taking care of each other. When we submit to God, that's what we're doing. We're saying, I'm submitting to you, and I trust your word. I trust your advice. When it says to obey, God is simply saying, you need to trust me and, and have confidence in what I tell you and believe in what I tell you. That's simply obeying God. No whips involved, no chains, no shackles. Simply God trying to set us free. And he says, just trust my word. Believe me. Believe me, trust me. You know, some people say that. You go, yeah, yeah. John 15, 5 tells us, without me, you can do nothing. It was our fault. Next, it's our, it was our fault that separated us from God. Because you believe it or not, God does not have any faults. I have found that out. People blame God for so many things yeah. when it was actually them. Yeah. And because of that, they push God away and they build that wall. God doesn't have any faults. God doesn't do things like that. I remember Jeremiah when he says, I have plans for your life. You know what he said? They're not for evil. Yeah. He assured us they're not for evil, they're not for wicked, they're for a, to prosper you. So God doesn't have any faults. We have to come to a place where we realize, oh, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And we know that God doesn't have you, so that left, that, that left it all in our court. So, when it's, so, so we know that a mediator, when there's two people that needs to be fixed, we need a mediator. That's what he's offering here because Galatians 3.20 says a mediator is not used when there's only one person involved. So both people have to be standing there ready to be restored for the mediator to begin to do his work. And we know that's Christ Jesus. But we first have to recognize that we have faults. We must first look at ourselves like we're instructed to do in Luke 6.42. Hang on. We need to look at the beam in our own eye. You know, and sometimes you've got to stand back from the mirror because that beam's really long. <laughs> yeah, it's a big beam you have in your eye. But we have to notice it, not somebody else. We must allow the mediator to address our faults that play into the scenario. Then let him heal us. You know, next step to restoration. Six, when we realize our part, we can pray for all the others. But you can't pray for all the others when you don't realize your part. Because your part, usually until you get to this point of restoration, it's all about you. Hey, it's all about me. You know, until I want restoration, I've got to surrender that to God say, it's not about me. Because you notice when you have broken relationships, it affects people around you. Especially if you're a married couple, it affects the kids around you. It affects friends around you, as well as each other. So it, and it can be relationship with friends out there in the world, whatever. We need to realize our part. Then once we get there, we can pray for other people. See how to take the speck out of their eye. Finally, when you got the beam out of yours. Romans 15, 12 says, uh, we must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Let's please the other person, not ourselves, and do what is good. That's Romans 15, 12. The last one is emphasize reconciliation to these people when you're delivering the message of reconciliation and restoration. Emphasize reconciliation or restoration and not resolution. It's restoration. Don't emphasize resolution. It's unrealistic to expect everyone to agree about everything. Amen? Reconciliation focuses on the relationship while resolution focuses on the problem. And you can reconcile and be restored together and still have the problem. But what you'll find in many cases, so many cases, 
that once you get restoration, the problem goes away. Because basically the problem was you. <laughs> Could be the other person. And there's the, the, the problems are insurmountable. But then when you come together and you reconcile with each other, no matter what you look like, no matter what, how you dress or how you think, you reconcile, you restore relationship, all of a sudden you go, what problems? You know, then you're free. Because this is something that's hard to find today, to disagree with somebody. I've had people turn on me because I didn't agree with them. I disagreed with them. <gasps> Shock. And I'd have to say to them, I thought we were friends. We were free to disagree. You should be, but there's a, there is a thing going on out there that's attacking that concept. That you're not free to disagree. But you know, when you reconcile, it doesn't matter if you disagree. At least you can sit down at the table and reason together. And you can work out problems, and if you don't agree, you can move on. But it doesn't affect your relationship. This is what it's all about. Restoration is relationships. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 38, 16 says, And in all these things is the life of my spirit. So you will restore me and make me live. Let me read that out of the Passion Bible. It's very powerful. Isaiah 38, 16 in the Passion Bible says, Lord, it is because of your kindness that life is given. It's in you that my spirit lives. Now restore my health and give me life again. Many people are sick because of their brokenness and their unforgiveness. The psalmist is asking God to heal my spirit because I am broken, I'm sick, so bring me health and bring me life. See, a broken relationship is like death. We were dead when our relationship was broken with God. And the price was the life of our spirit. Listen to Colossians 2.13. You were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. Hallelujah. He's brought you to life because of Christ because God forgave us of all our sins. See, that's the running foundation of restoration. If you can't forgive, you can't restore. Because for, when you don't forgive, you have those memories that won't go away. You have those issues you can't fix. But when you forgive, you find out that it doesn't make any difference. That what you hated, you can't even remember. I've had somebody tell me that one time. They couldn't remember why they hated me. I said, well, stop working on it. Let me give you a reason not to hate me. Because we get caught up in its grips. But Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. He came to set them free. To release them from that bondage. Amen? Amen? I love it. We're dead in our broken relationship because of our failures, our shortcomings, our sins. When we can reconcile with each other as God did with us, through Jesus, we will experience the life that God meant for us to have. Psalms 51, 12 says, restore us to the joy of our salvation. Amen. Amen. We just watched Mike and Susan up here. There's a, lot of, there's a powerful, powerful testimony that's behind what they did up here. It was great to see them celebrate 25 years but it's to know what they were up against, but the decision that they made. Yeah. A testimony to them, I tell you, a testimony of a restored relationship is a testimony of hope. Yeah. It builds hope and encouragement in the hearts of those that hear it and see it. It can put life back into a weary and defeated heart. I thank you for getting right with God and making your decisions. It's powerful. Unbelievable. Yes. It's affected my life and, and my, my family too. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.32 tells us to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, and here's that word that people shudder sometimes, forgiving one another. Why do people sh shudder at that? But they do. Even as God in Christ 
forgave you. Forgiving is an act of God. We need him to help us forgive. The key to the full restoration is forgiveness. After you've gone through the process with God and you experience his love through his forgiveness, you can feel the weight of sin lift off your shoulders and out of your heart. You need to pass it along. It's only through the love of God can we even approach another person and forgive them for the defenses they did and they caused. But listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. And this was quoted up here, and I didn't know that. Oh, how magical. I'm going to quote it now. Different perspective, but same verse. It says, love is patient and it's kind. This is out of the New Living Translation. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does, does not demand of its own. Love is not irritable. Maybe you may be irritable, but love is not irritable. Here's the one I have underlined that is powerful. It keeps no record of when it has been wronged. Remember, God doesn't look at your sin because he's sun conscious, not sin conscious. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Here's another one, powerful, underlined. Love never gives up. Do you hear that? Let that sink in a minute. Love never gives up. You may give up. Because maybe we make things about us, so we give up. But love never gives up. It's not about us. Never loses faith. Is always hopeful, and here it is, endures through every circumstance. Every circumstance. It's all about the bottom thing that carries us all is God's love. It is love that compels God to want to reconcile with us. I often think if I were God, would I want to restart restore relationships with us <laughs> thank thank god you're i'm not okay okay because i know how i am and i'm trying to fight that old man i mean look at the things that we do and say there's such a demonstration of hate in the world towards god and certainly to each other we can be a pretty vindictive creature we're so protective of our feelings we're easily offended when someone steps on those sensitive little guys you know our decisions regarding our relationship are all rooted in our emotions. Typically, how we, trust, how we treat other correlates to how we feel. But get this, love is not a feeling. So it nullifies that. Love is an act of will. And no matter how we feel, we want to please the Lord. So we act as he would, we give love. We, we cover ourselves with love. Life is meant to be shared the people around us that we have relationship with all will <laughs> relationship will either bring out the best in us or the worst. Have you found that out? I discovered when I got married that there's things that was required of me that was not required when I was single. And sometimes, duh, my hard brain, it took a while to figure that out. But you know what? It took a wife. It, you, you, God puts people in your life. You're going to be a married man then you need a wife to help bring that out of you. Then you want to be a father, you need kids. And then God will show you how to bring the father out of you with the kids. You want to be a good friend, God will teach you to be a friend first, and then friends will come to you. Every place that you are in life that God wants you to conquer that mountain, he will put people in your life. He'll put people, not objects, not rocks. You know, he puts people. And it's not always your favorite people. Seriously. But remember, they have feelings like that towards you too. So you're not a loner, right? See, God has called us to work on our relationships and not allow all this corruption to come in and destroy them. God's big on relationships. Amen. Amen. He sure is. Proverbs 27, 17 says that iron sharpens iron, says a friend sharpens a friend. Another translation said, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. That's how close it is. That's a close relationship. Close relationships will shine a light on each other's lives. And we avoid our close relationships. We choose to avoid the light that emanates from them. They can be, it can be too revealing. That's what scares us away. Because somebody comes in and they reveal something you've been hiding. So you push them away. But God wants to bring healing. Amen. You see, darkness hides our hurts, our faults, our fears, and our failures, and our flaws. But light causes us to see them. We need courage. 
So God told Joshua, you need courage. Because it says, you're going somewhere you've never been before. So you need courage. Don't be discouraged. He's telling us that sometimes this is area that we've never been before. So get ready. Be courageous. <clears throat> he says, we need courage to address our own faults and correct them and not respond as the old creature did would by, by rejecting the very person that God has given us to make us better, to bring out the best in us. So I, I'm trying to be sensitive myself to new people that come into my life. I mean, the moment I meet them, shake their hands, spend five minutes with them, I'm asking God, let me know. Is this good or bad? And you know what? Some do come in there bad. It's a test. And I just trust God, say, if it's bad, I'll let you handle it. If it's good, help me handle it. And it works. It works. I mean, even recently I've had people come in and I just have to say, this ain't right, Lord. Fix it. So we're working with the Lord. And then people will come in and I'll go, oh, I'm sketchy about that one. God says, bear with them. Bear with them. You know, I, you're, they're your assignment. Or I'm their assignment. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm everybody's assignment, okay? So everybody has to bear with me. I'm just letting you know in advance, okay? The Bible tells us to per pursue love. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, let love be your highest goal. God is love. You know, he can't help it. It's, it's who he is. It's what he is. It motivates him. He is a repairer of the breaches, a fixer of what is wrong. He knows the intents of our heart, and he will always lean in the direction of restoration. He's pretty straightforward, too. If you've talked to God and he's given you some instruction, he's pretty straightforward. He doesn't mince words. And he will tell us like it is, always out of love. But he will never mislead us, nor will he forsake us. It is his desire that the world knows this. How are they going to know it? Unless somebody tells them. It's through us that he can demonstrate this. The Bible tells us that they will know us by our love for one another. And by our love for one another, a demonstration is how far will we go with each other in every circumstance? How far? Eh, let's go a little further. Eh, let's go a little further. And the further we go with somebody else that's really not connected with us yet, but God wants us to, to press in, God gives us the ability. He moves with us. He says, you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Who gets to make the first move? I get to draw near to God? Okay, I'll draw near to you. And so that's what he's saying. The more we press into somebody, the more he'll give of himself to us so we can do it. <clears throat> when the restoration process gets tougher and tougher and seems that it's impossible to mend, to mend it or remember that nothing is impossible for God, he can work both sides of the coin. As with any process, restoration begins and ends with God. Trust in him to bring it to the desired end. What's important is that you don't give up and you continue to pursue love. Amen? Amen? Even if it's a prayer, and always let God reveal your heart to you, not to somebody else. And don't ask him to reveal somebody else's heart to you. You don't want to know. He let him reveal your heart, his, your heart to you and let him fix what is still under warranty in your life, okay? Let him fix it. And I end with this scripture. Again, Psalms 51, 12 out of the Passion Bible. It says, let my passion for life be restored. The psalmist asking God. Tasting joy in every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. Parentheses, trusting in your word and your advice and your leading. Yeah. It's trusting in God. Yeah. It's giving him everything. I commend what we saw today. I'm encouraged because no matter how bad things look, and I, I haven't, I know a little bit about what went on, and look at them. It's so angelic. They're glowing with God. <laughs> you know, the family's sitting there together. They've gone through this together. I'm just, I'm so encouraged to see what God will do in our lives. Amen. I'm encouraged to see what he will do with my brothers. Amen. I am no expert. They were born, I was gone. I'd already graduated, moved on, and they were born, and then all of a sudden, now here I am. Parents are gone, and I'm in charge. Whoa. And uh, I'm anxious and really not 
anxious. God says, be anxious for nothing. I'm anticipating to see what God is going to do. It's like my father. He finally accepted the Lord before he went. My mother did the same thing. My brothers, we're working on that. You know, so uh, pray for me. I'll pray for you. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for, the, for your word. God of restoration. You, you restore everything. We thank you for see relationships being restored, bodies being restored, minds, spirits. It's all about you, Lord, just giving us back the things that is ours that's been given, taken by the enemy, the canker worm, the palmer worm. Everything came and took everything that was ours and destroying our lives, but then you came in and says, I'm going to restore everything back to you. So we're having everything restored back to us, Lord, and we're grateful for the Holy Spirit to walk us each and every day to make sure we don't wander off on that rabbit trail again and keep us on the straight and narrow, totally aligned with you and with your word, with your spirit. Life is good. We thank you for your life. We thank you for your love. And we give you the praise today. And everybody said, amen. amen. Praise God. Give him a hand clap. So I guess before we go out with a bang here, is there anything I need to remind them? You already reminded them. Come out to prayer Tuesday. Seriously, it's powerful. You got to get a taste of prayer. Sometimes some people go, yeah, yeah, I pray. I do it, you know, once a week. Uh, or we pray for help. That's people's favorite prayer is help. But you come out and pray in unity with God because what we do is, is a warfare to bring change in our community, in your family, in your church, in your life. That's what prayer, intercessory prayer is all about. It is battling for each other. Sometimes you, it's praying at home by yourself isn't enough. You need to link your prayers and have an agreement. And that's what we do on Tuesday. So come out. I'll be looking for you. We're taking names, so. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Leave us out. I guess I'm just a little backup music. <laughs>